We are going to um, talk about uh, some useful algorithms to, to see how things are done um, um, in programming when you actually want to do some standard stuff that happens every day. So uh, there are certain types of things that you want to do many times inside a program, things that always um, are the same way to do, th um, how can I explain? Um, you want to search through a phone directory. So you look for the name and you find out what the phone number is, right? You want to um, find student records and see what was the GPA of the student. You look for the student number and you take the record out. So essentially searching and looking for stuff is a standard thing that you need to do over and over and over. And for that, we have a specific type of way of doing it. Standard way, and then people get their PhD on stuff like this. Like they literally sit over there and says, what is the quickest way to be able to find something? And there was this guy who actually used this an amazing um, algorithm uh, made by a mathematician, used that algorithm and um, created this, this very quick uh, search system. Um, and now it's called Google. Okay, so when you type something, it searches, it, it, and the algorithm is secret. Nobody knows what it is. Like, a, and it's, it finds so, things so quick. You just imagine, imagine the vast amount of information that you have on internet. So here are things that we're not gonna do. <laughs> I'm just gonna show you a linear one that you'll see what, what, what I mean. Or say we want to sort information alphabetically or based on certain thing and, and look at it in a different way. So we need to know those things and see how they work, okay? So we're gonna talk about those things a little bit. But before doing that, I'm just gonna review what we've talked about last time. So uh, we created, we showed uh, what uh, uh, a standard menu looks like. And we said whenever you have a menu system, the menu system works in a way that you have an endless loop. And in this endless, the beginning of the endless loop, what you do, and this is the review of what we talked about last time, what you do, you display the menu, you get the user selection, and based on the user selection, you do something. Uh, so each selection that user is making uh, tells you that you want to do something. And based on the user selection, you jump to a switch statement, and you do it, and you go to the end and come back to the menu, and you keep doing that until the user decides to leave, and one of the conditions over here is for the user to, to leave which in this case was X thingy that we did. So uh, menus work uh, this way. And we're gonna use this menu actually to do stuff today. We can do that, why not? Then we uh, reviewed what strings are. And we said strings are essentially, <laughs> strings are essentially, uh, is, this, is this second Gary over here too? <laughs> no, not here. So, so, so yeah, so we said uh, uh, strings are, they don't exist, we don't have such a thing called a string in C language. The C language, what we refer to as a string is, is again, another algorithm that we follow, another standard that we follow that all programmers in C follow, which means ending the data with an impossible character in a character array, uh, and that is a null character. So when we set the uh, a one byte to all zeros, we are essentially, um, uh, setting the termination of data, and like that we can find out where information ends inside an array. And we call that character array a string, so if somebody tells you what is a character array, it's essentially, uh, uh, it is essentially a null terminating character array. So that's, that's what it's called. Um, uh, how do we deal with it? We um, get the size of the character to the maximum possible size, and we fill it with the information that we have, and we cut the uh, uh, end short by setting the end of the thing to null. For example, over here we had 12 characters. We put the first four to G-A-R-Y, therefore G-A-R-Y will uh, be indicated as Gary, but to make sure that everybody knows that Y is the end of data, after Y we're gonna insert a zero. So essentially putting double quotes does that automatically, or you can manually write it, and you know that when you initialize an array to something, whatever is left will be set to zero. So that's how automatically it becomes null terminated. Uh, but what happens beside the scene is that every single argument will be set every 
single element will be set to the value and the last element will be set to zero and that makes the string a string. And doing so, we, uh, oh, we can, uh, following these rules and regulations, we can create libraries to, to follow that standard and we call that a string header file. Essentially, things like string copy because arrays are not single things. They are not one entity. You cannot set an array to another array. Setting an array to another array is essential, essentially means you have to loop through every single element and set every individual element. Therefore, you cannot set a string to another. There is no string again. String is just following a standard. So copying somebody's name from one string to another requires for me to go through every single character, copy every single character until I hit the null, and then I make sure that the destination is null too. We created that in our utils. We said we can actually do all those things ourselves. So we created something called SDR copy and we did just that. We started from the beginning of the source array and we went up to the point that source is not null. So as, as it goes through, which essentially means just put the source over here because we know null is false. Anything but null is true. So it's gonna keep going through it and put every single thing from source to destination, and when it hits the null, it comes out, make sure it is, that's the destination is null too, it comes out, and that's your string copy. We do SDRN copy, which means going right to the end, and that's, this is what we have in string uh, header file. So you're saying, I want to copy up to certain destination, it works the exact same with a string copy, but also it checks to make sure that the number of characters is what you wanted. So if I, the, the number of characters that I want to end this thing with is, I don't know, 50, I can put 50 for length, which means it's gonna look for null or 50, whichever comes first, and then stop. How they designed the SDRN copy in string header file is that the destination will not be null terminated if what stopped the loop is certainly getting to the, the loop. Why they did that? So, uh, for example, if I wanted to change Gary to Jerry, then I would say uh, str copy into the Gary string with J and E up to length two. So it copies J and E, but because it reaches the, tar the, the limit, it will not, not null terminate. Therefore, the first two characters are replaced. With str and copy, you can replace characters inside the string without cutting it short. You can use it that way. If you don't like it, you can always create your own function. So write something like str n copy. How do I, how do, what do I write over here to indicate that I'm terminating? str n copy and terminate? That's too long. And and terminate, ah, whatever, okay? And then I remove that if statement, which means it's always null terminated. So this SDR n copy and terminate uh, actually terminates too. So it's your choice what to do. Uh, the, 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 uh, the string header file doesn't have that one. There is no such thing in string header file. Um, but I'm doing it over here, so, so we terminate it. Okay, also what uh, is different between our SDR copy and SDR copy of the, of the string header file is that the string header file over here returns the address of the beginning of the destination to in case somebody wants to use it. Nobody ever uses it unless, you know, so we could like if I say over here character pointer and at the end of utils over here in SDR copy, character pointer, and at the end I would over here say return destination, then it would be identical to what uh, SDR string header file has it. So it copies, then does everything, and then returns the address of the target. So if you want to quickly get the, the, the address and do something, then you can do it. I'm not going to go through the detail, but what you see at line seven is exactly what we have in uh, string header file. The difference is that I put make the C capital to know it's ours, not the not the string header file. Anyways, so that's that's what we went through, and that's what it was.
So let's write a program now. So what I'm going to do over here is this. So um, uh, we had, uh, and what did we do last? We talked about foolproof entry. We went through, yeah, we went through, um, talk, we, we talked about Scanf and how Scanf can match a pattern if you put uh, uh, literal values in the read string, in the, in, the, in the format specifier. So anything you put in here will try to be read, and anything that is specifier for reading must match. Therefore, if I do something like this, it means a double, double should be read, then a dollar sign should be skipped, then a character should be read. So that's how it works. So that's uh, what we can do with, uh, with a scanf. And um, that's why, uh, for example, if you want to make sure that at the end of that one, so it's, it's if you want to make sure that all you have in that in that line is a double and a dollar sign and a single character and then nothing else after what you can do is putting a backslash in here if that backslash in doesn't exist that scanf is going to fail because it didn't match the backslash but well done we have the flush thingy so we can do that okay so another thing that we have in utils is flush right this flush key is fine. It's working properly. There's nothing wrong with it. But we could always make this flush key to give us more information, which is instead of uh, just returning nothing, I can return an integer. And in here, I can say it ret ret or uh, cnt, and I'm going to set that to 0. Okay, And I can actually make this loop do cnt++. And I can say return CNT. What good does this flush do now? The difference between this flush and the other flush is that this flush now can actually tell you if it flushed new line. If there's anything else was actually flushed. So if when you call this flush, if you are interested to know if it was more stuff over there, this flush will tell you. So if flush returns zero, it means the first thing that it got, it was a new line and it got out, so it's zero. But if it goes this loop and keeps flushing until it hits N, N now CNT is added. So if flush, if flush not, so you can actually do this now. You can go to utils.h and write a proper thing for it. So I'm going to say int flush. Uh, and I can do this. I'm going to say flushes the console. OK. And parameter name. Yes, there's nothing, no parameter name. I'm going to remove it. And returns, I'm going to say uh, number of characters flushed before the new line. Before the new line character. So something like that. So now if you uh, bring it over here, it tells you that it returns the number of characters flushed before the new line character. So if what you have is only new line, nothing's going to, it's going to return zero. So that's more information for you to, uh, to uh, decide if what you're writing is correct or not. Another thing that I, that I would like to do Let's leave that for all. OK, so that's that. Never mind. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these. And we're going to start what we're going to do today. OK, so what are we doing today? I have a file over here. It's called student.csv. When uh, you look at the contents of this file. This is what it is. Essentially, uh, students in a, in, in a school. So, and it's a student name, student number, and the GPA they got. Okay? So we have this record over here of students. 
Okay? The first thing we want to do, we want to read them. So we know how to do that. We're going to do it. So I'm going to actually, uh, uh, first of all, what I'm going to do is copy the menu system that I had. Copy. And bring it here. So what are my objectives? What do I want to do? I want to read. I want to be able to load the records, OK? And I want to be able to uh, show them in different orders. I want to be able to, um, and I'm going to write different things as, 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 as far as we can go. So probably sort them based on student number, then sort them based on GPA, sort them based on name. And what else do we want to sort it with? Sort them based on, uh, yeah, these things. And uh, be able to, if we have time, can do a little search too, like search for some, some student number and so on and so forth. So, so what do I do? Uh, I'm going to write my uh, menu system over here. I'm going to, uh, uh, first one is going to be load records. Load student records. Records, and I'm going to call that L. Okay, so if they actually hit L, it's going to load student records. The second one, I'm going to say uh, list, list, list records. That's another one. And list records, they're both list, so I'm going to may put this one R. Okay, and well, we can keep going later on. So for now, I'm going to do this, and then exit is exit, okay? So get user selection gets the user's selection and returns it. That's very fine. And uh, in here, I'm going to have the selection. So I'm going to say if it's L, I'm going to load. All, so that's going to be load. And if it is uh, R, I'm going to list. I'm going to print out list and go to new line. And in here, I'm going to say X and X. So why do, I, why do I have two cases over here instead of one? So if it's lowercase or uppercase, it both selects it. Because there is no break after the lowercase r, it's going to continue coming through. OK, that's how we can have many different choices for the selection. So that's my prototype. I immediately test it. I'm not going to let it stay for another thing. So, so, and my flush key is going to still work, although it's returning an integer. But because I'm not receiving the integer, it doesn't matter. So I run the program, and the program runs. And we're going to have uh, load student records and list student records. Right? So these are the things that I have. Now, uh, oh, okay, so invalid selection, and now I'm going to say uh, load. So it's going to say load. I'm going to say list student records. Actually, you know what? I have to, I, it's better to change it. R is better to load the records and L to list. Because <laughs> this doesn't really, I, guess I think that's better. So, I'm, and X is going to be exit. So, so I'm going to change that. So I'm going to say, I'm going to make this one and make this one L. So, because when you want to get the records, you put R. When you want to list it, you put L. So, we're just going to change these two. Run it again to make sure everything's good. Okay, so uh, that's loading, and that's listing, and X is exiting. OK? So it's working. Are we OK down to this point? OK. So the next thing I want to do, I want to deal with the students. So I'm going through steps of all the things that I've do, I've learned to do from the beginning of the semester. Now I want to deal with the student stuff. I'm not going to put everything in here. I'm going to put it in a module. So I will create a separate module with uh, a header file over here, add, new item. 
student.h, student.h. And in here, I'm going to say, if not defined, uh, Seneca student h, copy and paste. In here, I'm going to say define. Now that's mine. And then I'm going to go student.c over here, add new item, student.c. And I'm going to click on add. And all I need to do over here is to say include student dot h and as my module is ready to go okay now I can think so I want to be able to load the student uh, files so I'm gonna need to write a load function so in here I'm gonna say uh, function so if I want to write a function if you want to load information from a file what are the information you need tell me name of the word I want to load the name of a student. So loading the stu name students, I don't need student names. I need something else. If I want to go to a classroom, what do I need to know first? The room number. So I need to know the room number. I want to read the student records from a file. So what do I need? File name. File name. <laughs> you are going to say, oh, Again, turn the intelligence to off, okay? Turn the intelligence to off when you are designing a code, which means be dumb as a doorknob and see, I want to load. What do I need? I need the file name. Otherwise, how am I supposed to do? So we're going to call the name of the function load, okay? That's fine. And then in here, I need to get uh, a file name. Do I need to change the file name in here? No. So const character file name right and does load need to return anything if you are reading student records from a file what is a good thing for you to to return first of all i have i'm not finished with that thing yet i'm loading right i'm supposed to put it somewhere so this is where the file name is but where do i keep all the student records see I need to, where do I store? Now your thing comes in. Where do I store the student records? I have to have some kind of a package to have the student records. So I'm going to look at the, uh, the file. I have a student name, I have a student number, and a GPA, right? So I'll create that. I'm going to go to student header file, and in student header file, I'm going to say what to create a record? Struct, thank you. So I'm going to go struct, student, and in here, I'm going to say uh, character name. How long a name can be? I'll go, I'm going to take a look at the record, and I'm going to do like this. So now I'm at column 16. So that's 16. And then I'm going to go here. Now it's 23. And this one is 27. And that's it. So 27. So I'm going to put over here 128. <laughs> okay? <laughs> to make sure that it fits everything. Okay? It doesn't matter. I can null terminate and take it short. And because these days computers have gigabytes of memory, who cares? When we taught this 25 years ago, I would say you have to really think what it is and you have to truncate the name, yada, yada, because we only had 2Ks of memory. Okay? Now we have 15 gigs. And so. Yeah, I don't care. So the next thing I need to do is the student number. Look at the student number. Student number seems to be, uh, of course, all these things are talking with the client. So you tell to the client, what is the student number in your school? Client says, it's six digits. You've got to go up six digits. An integer is enough. Okay? And then you can ask them, what is the longest name you may have? And they're going to say 30. Then you're going to make it 60. So let's, let's, make, let's not make it too dramatic. I'm going to make it 60 characters. If I want it to be maximum 60, what do I do? 61. And for the student number, integer student number. Now, how many fingers? From 0 to 9. Now, if I want it all to be so that if I want to be negative and positive, which one of these two should be 0? 
let's make this one zero. So if this one is zero, it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four. And from here, I'm going to have minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, right? So if I have positive and negative, I have, you understand, you, you, you go, you, you see where I'm going, right? You can actually do the exact same thing. An integer is like, I think two billion or whatever. Two, it's two to power 32. Yeah. So, but half of that is occupied for, so for uh, negative values. Like for example, if you have a character, if you just write character, a character by itself is 127 positive and 128 negative, and a zero in the middle. If it's a, an ounce sign, it's from zero to 255, right? It's the same thing over here. Can a student number be negative? No. You can actually do something. You can actually add a prefix to any primitive variable, not any primitive integer. So character, what are the integers? Name it. One of the integers. Integer? What else? Oh, you said character? Character? Next. Types of integer. So she said character. Next. No, float is not an integer. Int. Okay, next one. Short. Next one. Next one. That's it. So, character, short, int, long, long, long. Any of these five things could be all positive if you want to. If you want to make it all positive, all you need to do is to go unsigned, int. Of course, you have to spell it right. Unsigned int. That means student number cannot be negative. Okay? If you want to do that, you can, just letting you know. And if you want to read or print it, you go with percent %u instead of percent %d. Okay? So percent %u is for unsigned. Okay? That's FYI. I don't know if we have it at all in our, in our thing in IPC 144, but it's a good idea to know. So anything you want to keep positive, you can do it that way. I'm just putting it over there. For you to know. But because student number is six digits, because student number is six digits, only really we don't need to make it negative because if it's five digits, it must be an error, right? Anyways, I'll put an unsigned over there just to show you we can do unsigned. Uh, keep that in mind, okay? So could be, I'm gonna say, could be, okay? I'm going to go back to this. Could be unsigned. Uh, and read and printed using percent %u. OK? <clears throat> and if you want to indicate that a number is unsigned, like you write, unsigned int a is equal to 5, you put a u at the end. So 5 u at the end makes it an unsigned 5. <laughs> okay, a literal value for 5. But anyways, student number. So on the next one, I'm going to put a float for a GPA, right? Because that's just a number that cannot be more than 4, right? So it doesn't matter. So GPA is fine. So I have my student record. Now, I am reading the uh, this is the, where the file comes in. Now I need to put it in an array. And to put it in an array, I can simply say struct student uh, std, and I'm going to put like that. So that's where I'm going to read everything into. You know, we can do that. You pass an array to a function, you can change the, change the array. Are we good with this? Do I need to return anything? If you want, do, would you, do, you, do you like to return anything in here? What would you like to return if you want to return something? Hmm? Success? Yeah, we could return. So what is success? Define success to me. And you read some information, right? So returning success, good. Return an integer for 0 or 1. Or maybe I can return more information with that 0 or 1. Pardon me? Student. Number of students read, right? And if I cannot open a file, I can return minus one, right? So 
And if it's zero, it means it opened, but there is no file. So I can actually do that. I can do all these things. I'm going to come over here, so returning in that one. And I'm just going to mention over here what happened. Reads uh, student information from a file, comma, separated. OK, and then we're going to come over here, file name. It's going to be a data file name, CSV data file name, comma, separated value data file name, uh, STD, array of student structure to be read into, and returns number of uh, records read, or minus 1 if file does not, or uh, if file cannot be opened. So now I have something that if somebody goes on it, they can actually see what my, my program does, right? Uh, and it says function definition not found. I can fix that, so let's create the definition. So that's going to be the, the, the thing, and in here I have struct student. And I think we're good. So the future of Internet Explorer is in Edge. Seriously, halfway through my work, and there's no option to, to, to. Microsoft, do you see this? Stop this. Continue. OK. <laughs> I don't know what that happened, but anyway. So now I'm going to say over here, so it, again, you include libraries only where you need them. I don't need anything in here, do I? No. So I'm going to come back over here. Now I want to open a file. I know I need standard input output. Every, all the uh, uh, library header files come before custom ones. So standard input output dot h. Now in here I'm going to say file pointer uh, file. Okay, it's set to f open of file name and for read. So we're going to have that. If you go back in time, okay, you can actually add a t over here, which means read text. Okay, or you can do read binary. Okay, but we don't do that. We just read. Okay. Um, um, because uh, oh, uh, my file is wrong, it's all capital. Okay. The fact that we have to mention is something is uh, text and binary comes from DOS operating system. DOS operating system was created a long time ago by Bill Gates when they created Windows stuff. And it was kind of a replica of, not replica, it tried to loosely try to imitate Linux. But what they did over here, they used the very old system of text, which was only using seven bits of a byte for a text. The eighth one was not used, the ASCII code. Okay? So text and binary were different. Because when you were doing text issue, you had to mention that the, the character that you're reading is seven bits and stuff like that, and the one bit is used for whatever. Uh, so you had to identify it. And that's why all the FTP thingies you have, all the FTP softwares that you have, WinSCP, uh, uh, all those things, you have to indicate you are actually uploading text or you are uploading binary. Because this, this is backwards compatible, and uh, th that's the reason. And that's why I always say use Git because that's smart. It, everything is binary. If on Linux, everything is binary. Why you need to have a text and a binary? It doesn't make any difference, right? So it doesn't matter if you open it for binary or text. It's all text. So that's what we are doing in here. Uh, we are following the, the same thing. We don't need to mention text. And that's not. So what I do, the very first thing over here is this. I'm going to say if file, f close, file. Always do this. So right at the beginning, before you do anything, you check to see if the file has something in it. If it's open, close it immediately. That's the most important thing to do. Why? Because if you forget it at the end, you're going to leave lots of resources. And few times doing that, you're going to crash your computer. So when you are saying, 
f open, that function actually conserves lots of uh, what we call heap memory, the memory that belongs to everyone. It borrows that to actually deal with the file. F close gives it back to the operating system. If you keep opening the files without closing it, first of all, you keep the files that operating its system opens on a hard drive, you keep them open so, opera so operating system becomes occupied. And also, you're losing memory. To fix that, you, the only thing you can do is to reboot your computer, okay? So you have to make sure it's closed. So that's a good thing to do. And then after I do this, I'm going to write my code for whatever I need to do. So I'm going to write over here. Uh, I've got to go through them one by one and read them, right? So to read the records, I'm going to say um, uh, int cnt. I'm going to say equal to zero. And I'm going to say while uh, uh, read, st while, uh, read student. And I'm going to put over here uh, a pointer of a student, struct student. See, I'm just student pointer. Uh, so, oh, sorry, read student. And I'm going to put over here address of std cnt. So I'm reading one student, and it returns success. Do I have that function? No. I just use my imagination. I thought. Oh, it's a good idea to have a function that returns true if I can read the student from a file. So I need to pass the file over here too. I'm going to say over here from file, read one student and tell me if it's successful or not. So I don't bother with the logic over there. If that's successful, I'm going to say CNT++, right? If it's not successful, nothing happens. So my function is complete, done. And now I can actually think about detailed stuff. Do I need to worry about how to read? No. In programming, procrastination is good. Use your imagination, write a function. And the functions don't have to be perfect. You may come back and change it. But that's what I do. I'm going to say, that's what it is. So how do I do it? I'm going to write it just right up here. I'm just going to bring it over here and put it up here. And I'm going to convert it to a function. So I'm going to say, so it returns an int for success, right? So I'm going to say uh, int ret. I'll be pessimistic, and I'm going to say return ret. And this has to be a file pointer. So I'm going to go file pointer. And this has to be a student, student pointer. So I'm going to go uh, struct student pointer s. OK, SP, just to know if it's student pointer, OK? So well, I have everything I want to know. Now I need to read, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say f scanf. Now I, the only thing I need to think is to set this ret to a correct va to a true value if, if it is successful. And, and that's it. That's all I need to do. So what do I do? I'll go f scanf from file, OK? And I want to read the student, so I need to know what the student is. I'm going to split the window and look at the student, OK? So first, I'm reading a name, and I'm looking at this too. So it's name, comma, student number, comma, GPA, right? That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say name up to comma, right? So I'm going to say percent, percent, and I'm going to say up to, comma, skipping a comma. That's name. Name is done. Now I'm going to say get the, what is the next one? Uh, student number, right? Student number is percent D. That's that one, comma. What is the next one? GPA. GPA is a float, so percent F. Okay, and that's it. So now I'm going to put it, so it's, SP name, I'm reading the name, good. The other one is SP uh, student number. Obviously, I have to pass the address to it. Name is already an address because it's an array. I don't need to put any address. And at the end, I'm going to get the GPA. SP GPA. There you go. Scanf is red. How do I know if it's successful?
Yeah, so if it reads one, two, and three, it's successful, right? So I'm going to say rat is equal to, so it returns three, right? So I'm going to do something really professional over here. If you're a kindergarten student, you write if scanf is equal to three, right? You say rat is one. That means something, it's good, right? That's correct? That's kindergarten version. C programmers don't do that. What does equality return? What does equality return? No, no, no. Quality. I write, so tell me this. What is, what is, if I write over here, if I write over here, X is equal to C and T being equal to zero. What is the value of X? One, shame on you. One. C and T is zero. Zero equal to zero is true. True is? One. Are we okay with this? Okay, so if I write over here 20, what is the value of X now? Are we all okay with that? Then why the heck I should write an if statement up there? Instead of writing if statement, I can say ret is equal to, I put the scanf, whoa, being equal to three. And I don't need to write this anymore. You know how much faster that is? So it, it says ret equals to, so it wants to evaluate the right side, correct? Calls the function, function returns three, three is equal to three, one, ret becomes one. Correct? Now, f scale returns anything but three, it will be, are we good? All right. Good, so we are down to the, so, so that we're gonna do that. Now, now we're gonna flush it, right? So, um, Make sure that there is nothing left in there. So uh, how do we flush? We say while f get c, that receives a one character from the file. So I'm going to say file. It's get char. f get c is the get char from the console, but from a file. While f get c is not equal to backslash n. So I just flush everything to make sure it's done. So that flushes. So if they have anything after, I ignore it. I'm going to say, okay, it doesn't matter if it's garbage after. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, those three things are, are what's important for me. Are we okay with this? All right. So we wrote that function. Now all we need to do is to make sure that it's actually in student header file. So I'm going to copy that and go to student header file, add it over there and put a semicolon at the end of it so we know what we are doing. And obviously when you go home, please add the three slashes over here and do it. So now I am reading information into a file and uh, it, 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 it looks okay to me. Let's minimize that. So we can try it and see if it actually reads it or not. Yes. Oh yeah, return CNT, thank you. <laughs> return CNT. So now I'm going to come back to my program over here, and I will have a student included over here. Why do I have two of these, and why do I have string header file? I don't want any of those. So in here, I'm going to say include student.h, right? Uh, and my utils have safe, safeguards, students have safe, everything's good, so I'm fine and dandy, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, and now I can come to my program, and in here, uh, I, I'm gonna create uh, an array of students over here. So in main, I'm gonna create a student, uh, 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 sorry, struct, student, uh, std. How many students I may have? I don't know, we'll ask the school. School's gonna say not more than 100. I'm gonna say no problem, 100, okay? 
Of course, I have a bug now in the system. If it goes more than 100, I'm doomed because this is going to crash. It's going to keep going higher than uh, the value. So if I go to my student.c over here, as you see, uh, the maximum is not what I have over here. So it's better to have those values that you have like that, like is, is it maximum 100 and things like that. Put it in your student header file and say, what do we say? We go at the top and we'll say over here, define, define max student uh, count to be a 100. Okay, so instead of using that, I'm going to use this everywhere. So I'm going to come in my program and actually mention that uh, I have a max student count in here. And now I can go back to my student.c because max student count is defined over here too. My load is going to say while cnt is less than max student count and so I can't, I'm not going to go more than that. Uh, if they change their mind and say it's 120, they have to go change that and recompile the code. Are we good? So now I prevented that thing. The safeguard is added, life is beautiful, and uh, we'll save it. The very first thing we do with compile, and we see actually what we wrote over here is, is correct with respect to syntax. So I'm going to so go like that, and it's not. So fscanf variable may be unsafe. Oh, we need the damn thing over here. Uh, output. On Linux, you don't get this message, but here we do. Define like that, and recompile. Seems to be okay, so let's close that, and come over here, and I'm gonna say, okay, so I have the student over there, and uh, I'm gonna say a load, so that's what I'm gonna do, and in load, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, um, Uh, integer number of students, um, yeah, set it to zero, doesn't matter, then I'm going to say uh, number of students is equal to, it was load, right? Load uh, from, what is the file name? Student, uh, students, dot comma, separated value, comma, separated value, right? And, and, uh, the student array, array is std, okay? And I'm going to say printf loaded percent d student records. And in here, I'm going to say number of student and run it to see if it matches. If it matches, I don't need to go through debugging. I'm just going to run the program. And in here, I'm going to say load, which is r and it hung. Let's see why. Didn't work. Okay. Didn't work anything. Control C. Let's see what did we do wrong. So, uh, so we go F10. <clears throat> we'll go through it step by step. We come over here. We display the menu. Get the selection. The selection was R to load the student thingy. Now we come over here, F10. Selection jumps over here. We go to F11 to go inside. And we're going to come over here. We have students.c, comma separated value for read. File is open properly. It's not actually. So it didn't open the file. And uh, it didn't work, so it, it, we didn't detect that. So all, so the mistake we made is that we didn't check to see if the file is open or not, right? So what I should have done was file and, correct? So if the file is not open, I'll know, okay? And in here, I'm gonna say, if file was not open successfully, now I can, now I can say CNT is minus one, right? So see, that's the process of development. Yes, what did I do wrong? We're okay? 
What? You have a you have a suggestion? No. So now I'm saying if the file is open and CNT is less than that and reading student is successful, keep adding and going, right? Uh, I don't know. We'll see if it's going to work this time or not. So I'll stop it. And this time I know where it went wrong. I'm going to put a stop sign right over here and run it again. Why didn't it open it? I don't know. We'll find out. Students, I don't know. We'll find out. Anyways, so um, I'm going to press F5. It runs and goes right up to that point. I'm going to put R over here. And we're going to come to this point. Now it's going to try and open it. It's going to fail. Oh, how come it didn't fail now? What happened? That's interesting. Why didn't? Well, I don't know. Anyway, so it opened it, and it re. re okay. Uh, Shift F11 goes out of the function. <clears throat> comes back over here. Shift F11 goes out of the function, so it should come here. Or oh, it's an endless loop. Let's see what's happening. Let's come in here <clears throat> one more time. F5, <coughs> R, and we're going to come over here. And F11, we are going in here. It's reading into the student. So I think this is the one that is hanging over here. That's Abram Simpson. That's that one. That's the GPA. And ret is true. Now, this is supposed to read one integer and return it. Yes, it's returning true. Comes out and adds one to it. Huh. Okay, it's working now. I'm going to come right down to, uh, at some point it has to fail. 10, wow, I have to go 60 something. Um, let's, now we're going to shorten, <laughs> we're going to shorten the data so we can actually see what's going on. So, um, or let me see if it's going to, if it's going to hang over here. So I'm going to go to run to cursor. Yeah, and that's where it's hanging. So why is it hanging in here? So my function is stopping at the end for some reason. I think this is the, the one that is causing trouble. I'm saying while it's not backslash and keep reading, and we are going, hmm. Comma separated value at the end. It looks okay. Okay, let me shorten this file. So I'm going to first save this thing as back. Dot backup. And open it and make it smaller. So I'm going to go only add existing item. I'm going to bring it up so I have it over here. And... I'm going to shorten it to, say, 5 and see what went wrong. So now it's reading, supposed to read 5. Now let's run it again and get to that point. And R. All right. Let's come in. Go in here. That's the first one. Reading. 2, 3. That's 4. Now let's go in. The fifth one is red. Is this, yeah, Allison. And uh, it's red one, comes out, CNT one, comes over here. Ah, I think I know what's going on. It comes back up, goes to read student, and F scan F reads. And this one hangs. 
So F get C is hanging. Let me see why F, F get C is hanging. F get C is supposed to return minus one. Oh, because it's not equal backslash. Okay, I'll tell you what is wrong. Okay. <clears throat> I uh, made a boo-boo. Now I'll tell you what it is. F get C is a function that is reading from the such a silly mistake, no voice mistake, but it's a good thing we learn from it. F get C returns an integer, which means it reads the next character, correct? And it keeps going until it hits backslash n, right? Now, what if it reaches the end of the file? It returns, it returns minus one. And because it get, got to the end at the last one that it was really zero, it got to the end, it returns minus one. Minus one is not equal to backslash n. It keeps doing it over and over forever. So that smartness of mine might not stop me in the back. Instead of writing a short thing like that, I need to do this. I need to say do. And in here, I'm going to say integers new line, something like that. And in here, I have to say new line is equal to, now I get this. OK. So now I'm going to say while new line is not equal backslash n and new line not equal EOF. So if it's any of those, it's supposed to stop. So now, if it's returning, if it becomes new line, if it becomes new line, comes false, the condition becomes false and comes is not new line. If it's EOF, this becomes false and comes out. So in both cases, it will come out and it will not read anything. And hopefully this is going to fix the problem. Does that make sense? Pardon me? Let's see. Let's see if it, uh, if I make a mistake again, we'll debug it. Okay. <laughs> So let's run it again. Now I'm going to do a control F5 without debugging. So I'm going to say R over here and I hit enter. Loaded minus one student records. So it's returning something wrong, but we'll fix that. Okay. X, goodbye. So the reason that it happened is that no, 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 no. Or? No, it's and. It's and. I just want to know why it. Oh, and in here I and in here I put it in a wrong way. X. It's else. <laughs> uh, CNT is minus one. So if it can't close the file, now I think we're going to be fine. So I'm going to say over here R, and five student records read. Now I can go back in here, and uh, and. Uh, uh, kind of revert this back to what it was before. Student back. CSV back. And now run the program. And hopefully when I do this now, oh, now XR, it's going to say 86 students record read. So now I'm good. All right? Now go for a break, come back, and we'll continue with the rest. Five minutes. So while you were at break, I quickly wrote the list because it's not very significant. I just wanted to list all the records that we loaded. So what does it do? It gets the, num uh, the list students get the number of students and the array of the students and starts from zero, 
puts the row thing at the top, uh, go through a loop from zero up to number of students, shows the row number that is plus one, then it puts 30 because it's not going to be more than 30. We put 60, so if it goes more than that, we have to change the format. We are not doing it now. Uh, 30 for the student name, 6 for the student number. This is left justified. Uh, this is uh, filled with 0. This is filled with 0. If the student number is smaller than 6, it's going to make it 6 digits. And 3.1 for the GPA, and it's going to show it that way. So when I run the program, If I just say list records, nothing happens because there is nothing loaded. So now I'm going to load it. So the records are going to be loaded. Now I list it. Now I can actually see all the, all the students with the row number and everything. So it goes through it, tells exactly what records I have over there. Are we okay with this? Well, the next thing I'm going to do over here, I'm going to kind of uh, scramble these things, shuffle it. Because I'm going to go like this. I'm going to put it at the top. And I'm going to come over here, put it at the bottom, go back up here, put it halfway through. So uh, it's not sorted anymore. So now if I run the program, it will still work. So load the records and list the records. They are not sorted. Okay? Let's say we want to sort this thing based on student name. See how we can do that. Okay? For that, we need to learn a new algorithm. And that's how it works. <clears throat> False. Sorting. How can we sort? Uh, what do we do? Let's say this is, a, this is our array. So I have an array like this. All right? One, two, three, four, and five. OK? If I want to, and I say I have values over here, 2, 3, 1, 5, and 4. Okay? I want it to be sorted ascending, which means I want it to be from 1 going to 4. Okay? So what do I do? <clears throat> I'll start with a loop. Okay? I want to compare neighboring values and come down. To do that, how many times I have to... How many times I have to go? This, is, this has five elements. How many times I have to repeat the loop? Four times, right? So to, to compare these once, to compare these once, I have to do n minus one times going through this, right? Whatever it is. So n is five over here, right? So let's put this thing over here and start doing the comparison. So that's that. So I compare these two. Is the smaller one up? Because that's what I want it to happen, right? It is up. So I don't do anything. I just put, let it be as is, right? Now I'm going to come compare the next one. Is the smaller one up? No, it's not, right? So I switch the two, all right? So this becomes one. This becomes three. Right? Now I'm going to compare the two. Is the smallest one up? Yes. Now I compare the two. Is the smallest one up? No. So I switch. That was the first one that I did it, correct? First pass that I went through, correct? Now let's do it again. Compare the two. Is the smallest one up? No. So I'll do it. So I'll go one and two. Now compare the two. Is the smallest one up? It is, right? So I'll put it over here. Is the smallest one up? Yes. Is this, uh, so I'm going to put it over here. Is the smallest one up? Yes. So it's done. It's finished. Because I didn't do, I did one replacement only at the top, correct? So one replacement is up. I need to make sure that everything is good. So I'll do it one more time, and I see if there is any changes happening, and I'll go. So this was the best case. If this, is, this was the, the sort that happened halfway through. The worst case scenario is for everything to be in reverse order. And 
you do that, you'll find, so sometimes you may stop halfway through. When you are comparing everything and you see no replacement happens, just stop. You don't need to continue the sort. It is already sorted. But if, it's, if it is, look, in this type of thing, so now, Five, four, three, two, one. Right? So compare the first two. Four comes up, right? Five comes down over here. Correct? Compare the first two. Three comes up. Five comes down, correct? Compare the next two. Two goes up. Five comes down. Compare the two. One goes up. Five comes down. What happened? The biggest one came down. Do I need to compare the last one at the end? No. So that becomes, now, this is n minus one time. So the second time I go, I need to go n minus two times. I don't need to go as much because I know the biggest one is at the bottom. Right? It pushes it down. So let's do it again. So 5 comes over here. It's not going to be checked anymore. Now, these two. Obviously, 3 goes up. 4 comes down. Right? 4 and 2. 2 comes up. 4 comes down. 4 and 1. Okay? 4 comes down. 1 goes up. And I'm at the end. Correct? So now, let's do it one more time. And minus 3. So 4 and 5 will be here. Now compare the first two. 2 goes up, 3 comes down. 3 and 1, 1 goes up, 3 comes down, right? And I stop. And minus 4. The first three are done, so I'm going to go 5, 4, 3, and compare the two. 1 goes up, 2 comes down, it's sorted. So it's, uh, and, and as you see, the, the loop happens like that and everything's, uh, it, it's sorted and everything's done perfectly. So we're going to attempt to write it the same way. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then we're going to make it efficient as we are going through it, okay? So we're going to do the exact same thing. I want to sort by, by name. So what I will do, I'm going to write, uh, uh, I'm going to go in student. In here, where is the student? Uh, so in here, I'm going to say void sort by name. By name. Obviously, I need to know number of students, right? And uh, I need the, oh, and in here, I made a mistake, by the way, people. Read the student's file, load the student is uh, fine. This is supposed to be constant because I'm not changing anything. I'm just printing them. So I made a boo-boo. I'm going to fix that. It, as you see, it runs, but it, it, from logic's point of view, that's a wrong thing to do. You, have, you need to make it, a, make it as is. So sort actually needs to change it. So struct student std. And I'll do it that way. So that becomes sort by name. OK. So what do I need to do? I need to do a for loop, i starting from 0, and i less than number of students minus Number of students minus one. We proved that. We don't need to go through it, right? And I plus plus, correct? And we need to go from the top. So I'm going to go integer I, integer, and J. <clears throat> but if you see, this is one loop. And yet, 
this is another loop, correct? And every time that I'm doing the comparison between the two, I have to shorten it over and over. So now in here, I'm going to say for j, instead of starting from, um, up. anyways, I'll start from zero. Start from zero, and j less than, uh, how many times do I have to? I'm not going to do any optimization. Number of students, uh, let's make it minus one again. And I'm going to go j plus plus. We're going to correct the things later on, okay? The number of things that we are to do and which one is supposed to go what. So I am going all the way to the end every single time, okay? Bad person I am, but who cares? So that's that. Um, all right, so what do I need to do? I need to compare the two uh, th things that are side by side. So I'm going to say STD. I, I need to compare, so I have to have if this one's name is greater than the other one. So if this is greater than this one, I have to switch it, right? So what do I do? I'm going to say if I need to use a string compare. So I'm going to say string compare. I already wrote it, I think, in, in utils. Did I include utils in here? No, I didn't. So I'm going to include utils. Util.h. Now I can use string compare that I have. So I'm going to say compare the two strings string compare between uh, the left one is STDI, right? Name. And the right one is STDI plus one dot name, correct? If this is greater than zero, it means the name is greater than the other one. Now I have to swap the two, replace the, the two. So in here I have to say swap as student, as student I with student I plus one, correct? Swap the two. And to actually swap, I have to change, I, I want to change the value, so I have to pass pointers. So I'm going to write the swap right up here. I'm going to say void swap struct student student pointer s1 and the other one has got to be struct student s2. Right? To swap two things, what do I need? If I want to exchange the coffee in here with the water over here, and water in here goes to here, what do I need? I need another cup. I have to first pour this thing in another cup, then I have to pour the coffee in here, then I have to put the water in that. So I need a temporary cup to switch between the two. I cannot, okay? So what do I do? I'm going to create a temporary cup over here, struct, student, the good thing about structure is that it's one entity. So I'm going to say temp. Because it's one entity, if I say this is equal to target of S1, everything that is in S1 will actually go into temp. What is it doing in here? Incomplete type is not a law. What the? Oh. These are all capitalized, I think. Yeah, so everything from S1 will go, I, do, I don't need to do any string copy anything because it's two objects, right? Everything will be copied from one to another, like a Xerox copy of the other one. Now that I have that one, I'm going to say S1, target of S1 will be set to target of S2. So now what happens? Everything from S1 will go, S2 will go to S1. So S1 will have what S2 has. All I need to do is to put into target of S2 the value of 10, and the two are switched, swapped. And hopefully that's going to sort it by name. So if I, do I, did I write this thing um, in here? 
yeah I have to sort by name so I'm gonna go in programming here and in here I'm gonna say uh, sort by name and I'm gonna pass number of students and the student in here and hopefully so and here I'm going to say printf because there is no message over here. I'm going to say sorted. Okay. So let's first run it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we're going to go debug. So if I run the program now, I'm going to load the students. It's out there. 100 student records. Exit. What did I do? Oh, I added some by mistake. Huh. Some, some names are duplicated. <laughs> I added some by mistake, so let's make it 90 94. Okay. Actually, it worked. It means if it reaches to the limit. Anyways, so I'm going to say, uh, now I'm going to say load. So 94 lo records loaded. Now I'm going to say list. It's got to get listed, obviously not sorted. Now I'm going to say n which is sort by name. Now it's going to say sorted. Now I'm going to go back and list again. And when you list, it didn't work. Let's see why. Okay. So we started from here. We, let me see, what did I do wrong in here? I list the number of students, J list the number. greater than zero. Hmm. Did I call it properly? Let's see. So let's come over here and run it. What is this message here? So I know what we're wrong. Um, we, we are checking neighboring stuff, right? This is where the comparison is happening, right? Instead of I, I put, instead of J, I put I. Because this is going through the, the <laughs> I should have put J over there. I didn't check, check, check the neighboring, so I'm going to go over here, J. Let's do it one more time. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, load R and then sort and then uh, list. Still no? What's going on? String compare j, j plus 1, name greater than 0. Hmm. It should work. Let's go through it. Square 5, load, and sort. Okay, so um, let's come over here. I'm going to have two things added to my watch. This is the first watch, adding to the watch list. And the second one, added to the watch list. So now I have a watch list that shows me what the values are. And one by one, I'm going to go through it. So. It starts for the first swap. What? No, no, I, I did load it, didn't I? Oh. Oh. 
Okay, so oh R R R loads. And now sort. Okay, now now let's go. Okay. So so it's checking these two. This is good. Nothing happens. Now check these two. Good. Nothing happens. These two. Ralph. Good. Well, it's sorted. Oh, it switched it. Oh, did I sort it in reverse? I think I sorted it in reverse. Did I sort it in reverse? Let me see. Stop. So, uh, one more time. Uh, load the records. Sort it. And list. No, same thing. Okay, I'll find out what it is. I'm not going to bore you with this. Why? This, this is this is okay. Why is it? So the string compare we wrote in the utils was not right. That was that's why it wasn't comparing the things properly. I'll double check that one. I used the string compare for, from string header file. I don't think we tested it last time. So now if I uh, run the program, and if I load uh, the records, and I list it, this is unsorted, then I sort it, then I list it, and it's going to be sorted alphabetically from A to A to Z. So, so the sorting is working properly. The only thing that I added over here that did not mention was this I over here. This I just does this, so it means goes less every single time. For every loop that you go forward, it compares one less. So I just incorporated that. You see, it's minus one, then it becomes minus two, three, four. So this essentially becomes, this is the first one, becomes n, uh, one minus one, minus two minus one, minus three minus one. And therefore, it goes like that. Well, anyway, so that's the sorting. Um, and that's it. That's all. Um, we got a pause. We, we got paused on that one. The next day you are coming in for the for the for the lab. I am going to show you how we can sort the same array in three different ways without changing the values of the array. Okay, uh, for that one, I would like to ask you to please review the pointers. Okay, review the pointers before you are coming here. Uh, so this is just the sorting that we have done, and it's a standard thing, but. What I'm going to do next time is without changing the sequence of the data in the array, I'm going to sort it. So what I will do will be instead of sorting the array itself, I'm going to create an array of pointers that is pointing to every and each element. And instead of sorting the array, I'm going to sort the pointers. Therefore, the arrays are going to point to the thing in an orderly way. Therefore. If you want, you can create three arrays of pointers. One of them sorts the, the content by name. The other one sorts it by student number. And last one sorts it by GPS. So without changing the contents of the array, you can sort it in five different ways. It's as if instead of everybody lining up in a lineup, and the first one is first, second one is second, third one is third, I give everybody numbers, and everybody sits everywhere. The person who has number one is the person in lineup. It, you don't have to be at the top tip of the line. The, the, the one that has two is the second in lineup. So that's essentially what I'm going to do. Create a pointer and do that, and that's going to be the end of IPC 144. Even that is uh, uh, not part of IPC 144 per se, but because we know pointers, it's a good example, example to show you to see what happens. Yes? No, no, I'm going to go take a look. I, there's, it's, a, it's a small boo-boo over there that I, it's, it's, it, it is my string compare in here that made, that made the mistake, the string compare here. I have, I have to see why, 
or because I say not equal to. Yeah, that's actually correct. Oh, I put I of this. No, this looks okay. So it compares if they are equal. I don't know why is it not right. This should. I'll go through it and see why this is not working. But this string compare is essentially this. I'm going to check it out and see why it didn't work. Hmm. We'll find out. I met some boo-boo somewhere in this string compare, and I'll find out what it is. Anyways, that's the nature of programming. You write something, and it's not right, <laughs> and you have to fix it. It doesn't matter how many years of programming you're doing. You're going to make same boo-boos all the time. Uh, questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right. So the next day you are coming in for the lab, we're going to have our last uh, thing that I'm going to talk about throughout the semester. You're going to do a little uh, quiz as usual. And online quizzes are going to be posted tonight. So be aware of those. And have yourself a beautiful, beautiful day.